So marketing to millennials, boomers, and Gen X. Well, first of all, why do we care about this? Let's see, get my slides working. You know, I've been training people how to use Zoom and give their presentations all week, and then it's me that's having the uh, difficulty in moving my slides. Okay, I think we're good. So why are we talking about this? Well, largely these audiences are misunderstood. However, if you really get to grips with who the audiences are, generally you will end up talking to and engaging those audiences in ways that is more familiar to them. And therefore you're very more likely to get better reviews, to win more business, to overall make the business more successful. There are a lot of ways that companies and the Census Bureau and organizations around the world define who these audiences are. And even as you will see today in some of the charts and data points I captured for us to look at today, even in those you will see there is some disagreement around the ages of the audiences as we're talking about. We're also going to talk about this because it can be a little bit fun. It's an opportunity for us to poke fun at each other a little bit. Whilst we're going to be touching on five or six generations today, actually the ones that probably get the most popular press at the moment is millennials um, and they're often millennial has become a negative term and the okay boomer um, revolution has also become a negative term in reality uh, these are just different audiences of society my guess is most of you would think that millennials are young they like avocado toast on everything, they're lazy, they don't work as hard as previous generations used to. And as we go through this, you're going to see that actually probably some of the things we thought about a lot of audiences are not true. Now, I technically am not a millennial, I am close to it, but if you look at this chart, what's interesting is uh, millennials here, also called Gen Y, is born 84 to 96, it used to be that with these audiences, we would say that millennials were born 1977 to 1996. The reason why Xennials was introduced and is the shortest of the generations on the fairly standard lists is that these audiences are largely defined based on things that give them unique characteristics. And therefore in business or in marketing, we need to think about working with them in a different way. So the Xennials are very interesting. I just fall into the Xennial category on the older end. The Xennials are people who are, uh, they were born into an analog world, but they had a digital adulthood. And so they are that crossover. When you get into the millennials, the Gen Y, those who were born in 1984, really all of their important years, if you think when they're 10 years old, that's 94. Uh, they were really um, decent games consoles, access to internet, the phones were starting to get better, etc. The Xennials were really the tail end of that generation that did not really have that in childhood, but then went on to have it in a later life. The Generation C is kind of a sad one. Um, I keep hearing this coming up, and usually if we keep hearing these things come up, they tend to stick. Generation C is probably people who uh, will live through in their early childhood and early adulthood the uh, COVID crisis around the world. And I think this is the first time a generation has been defined based on anything like a pandemic. And so I'm sure there'll be even more disagreement around what ages those will be as different countries deal with what we have going on. The other proposed name that you may hear come up for the younger part of Gen Z and the what is potentially Gen C is the makers. And the reason for the idea of the makers, as we'll see in a moment, is the millennials and the Gen Y have really transitioned into predominantly being, or at least wanting to be entrepreneurs, do their own thing. They're pulling away from corporate America. As we go on more and more with that, particularly as we've seen something like the pandemic decimate so many standard businesses, that maker generation will really have to embrace the gig economy and find revenue for themselves and their family in ways that they have never really had to before, which is, uh, I think, very interesting. Now, I wanted to mention hipsters 
because usually when I talk about this subject, a lot of people say to me, oh, well, what about the hipsters? Interestingly, hipsters, they're not a generation in the way that the generations on our previous slide are defined as. Hipsters really are more of an identifier of people who are into certain things. Interestingly, the term hipster has also become very derogatory. Uh, there is a wonderful example, though, about hipsters. What you generally find with any generation, sorry, not with any generation, with any movement, like when you think about punk rock, when you think about hipsters, when you think about disco, you had so many, uh, when you think about goth, that's a, a great example for this, you have so many individuals who are wanting to pull away from what is standard and find their own unique style so that they feel they have their own self sense of identity. In punk rock, in goth, the looks were actually quite disparate. And so you could be conforming from the outside view, but actually inside that view, you were probably quite individualistic. The hipster movement actually has seems to have drifted into such a common set of characteristics that we get wonderful, amusing headlines like this. A man threatened to sue a magazine for using his photo in a story about how all hipsters look the same only to learn it's not him in the picture. Now that to me is just fantastic. I think if anything there is uh, that demonstrates <laughs> that a group of people have drifted towards so much commonality that there's very little individualism left anymore, it's, uh, it's probably that one. I'm sure there might have been cases like that in the punk rock and, and earlier goth eras at the time if, uh, if people wrote about those sorts of things. So I thought it would be interesting to look at these generations in the corona pandemic period. These charts, and I'll tick off a few things, I don't quite know how obviously large each of your screens are. These charts are showing media consumption during the COVID period. And I'm going to show you four. So this is Gen Z and millennials, and this is Gen X and boomer. And there's a lot of interesting things to see about this. Some of it will be a surprise, some perhaps not so much. So the Gen Z diagram on the left hand side, you can see uh, the large spike towards the left and that is online videos that people are watching. Online videos today are consumed with uh, YouTube, Vimeo and now the rise of TikTok and I'm blanking on the name, the big video game playing streaming service, uh, Twitch. Twitch, if you haven't heard of it, is a international online streaming video slash TV station. I use that phrase TV station nervously. Within 18 months of it existing, so many people were watching other people stream themselves playing video games and describing it. It became the largest equivalent TV network in the world. In the world. That is absolutely incredible. So when we think online videos, we may think, oh, well, that's YouTube. Yeah, that kind of makes sense. Actually, it's probably not YouTube that's particularly high up on that list. It is probably some of the other things. What also comes up here is, uh, is TikTok. And I'm going to try something here. So I have four teenage daughters. And I asked one of them to put together a short video for you. This is only about four minutes long. Um, she is going to describe to you what TikTok is. She's 13. She is the absolute audience for TikTok, with certainly the younger age of it. And what amazed me was she did some research around the, uh, the way people use it and the amount of money people wake, uh, uh, make from it. So I'm going to play you this little four minute video for you to learn a little bit more about what TikTok is. What is TikTok? TikTok is a Chinese networking service used to create lip syncing, dances, and other short videos. The uh, app allows users to create videos from 3 to 60 seconds long. Some videos have short clips from popular songs, while others are custom sounds. This is a TikTok. video with her mom. This video got 73.1 million views.
Who uses TikTok? TikTok's main audience is 13 to 24 year olds. These kids were born between 1996 and 2007. TikTok has more than 800 million users around the world. Can you get famous from TikTok? It's not uncommon for people to become celebrities going beyond the fame of TikTok. Zach King, who has 40.9 million followers and is 30 years old, has become famous on many other social platforms like Vine and Facebook with 40.2 million followers on Instagram. Addison Ray, who has 32.4 million followers, got to sit in the front row at Paris Fashion Week, and she's only 19. Charlie D'Amelio, who has 47.7 million followers, has starred in the Super Bowl ad at age 15. These stars make between $4,500 and $25,000 a year. How do companies use TikTok? Beyond individuals, companies are starting to use TikTok to promote their business. Like Chipotle, hashtag lid flip, where if you could flip the lid onto the container, you got free delivery. Okay, I'm doing the Chipotle lid flip challenge. It's this easy. Wow, I can put it like that. What's up, guys? I'm doing the Chipotle lid flip challenge. It's this easy. Crocs created a campaign where users were encouraged to show what they think their Crocs would look like if it cost $1,000. What do you say? Them so ugly, what are those? I would rather see a toe. Is going out and that's what you chose. And we all can't dress any show. She said, No, we will have a when I'm high. No, we said, Run, go. Cause I'm fly. You wanna crop up there? What do I like? Lord, she said, It's oh my. These are just two examples of the many companies using TikTok to promote their business. To find out more about TikTok, visit these websites. You should check out TikTok. Thank you. Okay. Everybody feeling super old now? Let me come back into presentation mode. Did you catch some of the stats that she read out there? It has 800 million users around the world. That one video she showed had 71 million views. I looked it up, it had been live eight days. Governments struggle to get people to watch that much content in that period of time. And TikTok is largely videos on loop that from what I can tell are three to 20 seconds long. So when we look at this chart and we see Gen Z over here on the left hand side and how uh, this is the media consumption of COVID, uh, online videos will include things like TikTok. Now, of course, online TV streaming and music streaming were big for them. You can see physical press, broadcast TV, online press, even interestingly for me, podcasts are through the floor. They're not really bothering about that too much. Now, millennials is very interesting because they have a little bit of a broader, um, a little bit of a broader, uh, what's the phrase I'm looking for? Consumption pattern. So online videos, they watch more broadcast TV than Gen Z does. Online press is definitely something that grows for them. Online TV streaming for sure. Now, in comparison, when we look then at Gen X and Boomer, let me just flick through those two again so you can see it. Look at the visualizations of the different patterns there, how significantly different that is. This is millennials on the right-hand side, and when I click to the next side, that's boomers on the right-hand side. 
So Gen X, you can see, is nearly all about broadcast TV, but still with a diverse distribution. They are definitely still listening to radio, and they're looking at the digital version of what they were used to in analog world. So they're looking at the online press. Online TV streaming is still, uh, is still very big for them. The boomers, it's broadcast TV. There's a little bit of radio. I was actually surprised to see how low that is. I think in different countries that would be very different. Um, the none of these question in the bottom right hand corner uh, around 24% was a little bit surprising as well. But those patterns of media consumption are amazing. Now for inspectors, I understand you're not uh, obviously out advertising in the way a lot of other businesses are, but we do also have realtors and uh, insurance people listening in on this. When you think about how you want to target these different sets of home buyers, this media consumption chart is absolutely uh, incredible in its difference. Now, I'm not going to go into this chart too much. If anyone wants the link to it, uh, I will uh, happily share it for later, but I'll give you a kind of second to digest it. Essentially, what it is showing is the dark of colors is a higher percentage. And so when we asked people about, sorry, not when we, when these guys asked people around the internet activities, no real surprise, searching for COVID-19 was very high up. Um, and then right down to the bottom, ironically, seen as we're on a webinar, watching for webinars was very uh, low. One thing I wanted to point out is four from the bottom, it says watching esports. For those of you that haven't come across esports yet, this is arenas filled with people watching people play video games. So right at the beginning, we talked about how Twitch came along and became one of the largest national, uh, largest global broadcasting uh, units in the world. That's what esports is now for sports. Lots of us are thinking, oh, it'd be nice when sports gets to come back. There's a whole generation of people who they haven't lost the sports that they watch because they watch esports and people are still streaming that on places like uh, Twitch and also then recording videos and putting them on YouTube and putting them on TikTok. And what's interesting for them is when they make their own videos and share them, it's also can be a significant revenue stream um, for them. So let's go back to the uh, millennials versus the baby boomers for a moment, um, because this is the one that tends to uh, get uh, a lot of press attention because it's lazy journalism, really. Uh, when asked people in lots of different countries, it was actually a sample size of almost 19,000 uh, in 23 countries. The adjectives that people use to describe millennials were, as you can see, things like tech savvy, materialistic, selfish, lazy, and arrogant. The terms used to describe the uh, boomers was quite different. It was respectful, work-centric, community-orientated, well-educated, and ethical. I mean, that's a wonderful set of things to, uh, to be known by. I did some research into this, though, and I'm just looking on my pieces of paper here today from all of the notes from everything we did, see if I can find it. Um, the idea of lazy, the idea of not leaving home, when you dig into the stats, is actually not a particularly fair uh, pair of derogatory terms. In the recent US uh, census, the last one that we have the full data set for, obviously not the one underway, 1.4 million boomers were looking after their adult children. Equal in number, 1.4 million millennials were looking after their boomer parents in their home. Millennials are the first of the true financially hard hit sandwich generations. That does not mean that's their food preference. That means that they are likely to having to be financially supporting their children and financially supporting their parents. Some of the characteristics of boomers is that they are incredibly ill prepared for retirement and that pressure is going to fall down onto the millennials. Now, when we think about communication, and this isn't just advertising, I would say this is applicable to all of you when you're just talking about your buyers and your realtors, how you talk to people and the channels through which you talk to them will really make a difference as to whether they want to continue to work with you. So the maturists, again, back to my point that different people have different names for these generations, I'll come back to that in a moment. The maturists pre-1945, the boomers 45 to 60-ish, um, going up through here, Gen X, Gen Y, Gen Z, Look at this one line up from the bottom in terms of con uh, communication media. The maturists, their preferred form of communication is formal letter. The boomers, it goes to telephone. Gen X, it goes to email and text message. Gen Y, it goes to text or social media. So that means, for instance, messaging through Facebook Messenger. And then look at Gen, uh, Gen Z. 
it is not even any defined format. It is just simply that something they want to easily to be able to communicate with using their handheld communication device. That's fascinating. That creates a real problem for us all in business because we now have to be ready for this generation of Gen Z slash millennial uh, slash Xennial and uh, Gen C or the makers for them to want to reach out to us in all sorts of ways that we perhaps haven't even considered yet. And so that's something we're thinking about the product for the long term, but it's also something I really want you to think about. I would say a takeaway from this for now at least is be prepared to offer people a text message based service. Be prepared to connect Facebook Messenger somehow to your site so that people can communicate you with you that way. Facebook Messenger, I will say it's a good start, but the uh, the younger generations now don't really care about Facebook. The generation, uh, the age of people on Facebook is certainly getting older and older. The uh, younger uh, crowd are just really not coming in there at all. And the bottom line, which I'm trying to get my cursor to hide your participation box so I can read it. The bottom line here is preference when making financial decisions. This is very much in the wheelhouse of what you all do. Maturists on the left, face-to-face -face meetings. I don't think that's really any surprise. The boomers, face-to-face -face ideally, but will increasingly go online or they will use the telephone, I should add. Um, Gen Z solutions will be digitally crowdsourced. That means probably the platform you're using most with people born after 1995, three to five years from now, they don't exist yet. I mean, imagine that they don't exist yet and they will be the platforms that for that generation you have to think about the most. So this is specifically looking at the millennial cohort and this is the reasons why uh, they will avoid an incoming phone call. Uh, time consuming calls, they don't want to be on the call. They think that the communication can be much faster through all the methods such as text messaging. <laughs> a whiny or needy person, that's the millennials really not helping each other in terms of how they're perceived for sure. Um, someone wants a favor, favor verbal confirmation, etc. I would say the thing to take away here is time consuming calls. They don't want to be on those calls. They want to communicate it through another channel. And I found this wonderful uh, graphic, which is exactly what the behavior of that is like. We see it in interactions in business all the time. They would rather either let the call go to voicemail or just decline it and then text them back and say, oh, sorry, did I, did I miss your call? So great cover of Time Magazine, which uh, was poking fun and trying to correct some opinions around uh, the millennials and zennials. And they might be the bucket butt of the joke and lots of people might still think they're 25 years old, which they were once, but they're certainly not now. A friend of mine is an expert in generational um, uh, advertising and marketing communication. And I called her and I asked her for some interesting stats that none of us might think about. So millennials turned 40 this year. They're not 25, millennials turned 40. They will be 75% of the workforce in 2030. They are 50% of the workforce today. 40% of millennials have, have lost at least one parent already. When you think about home buying and selling, that matters, they're inheriting. They're not getting married at all, or they're waiting until their 30s. The one that blew me away, and it's really the first time this has happened in Europe or in the States since World War II, is marketers often think about the woman as the manager of the household and the man as the primary breadwinner. And I know, I'm just telling you what the industry thinks. I have four daughters and I definitely don't think that way. And rightfully, because this has now changed. In certainly the coastal states of the United States, not only is the female of the household, the household manager still, but in more and more cases is now the primary breadwinner. I heard a story the other day, my sister lives in England and she has a, um, a set of care homes, that's her business. And she is buying a care home this week from an individual, this older gentleman. And she has to keep putting my brother-in-law, her husband on the phone because he won't answer her questions because she's female. Now, first of all, it's 2020 and this is still a thing. I'm sure many of you, particularly the women on the line will have experienced this yourselves. Um, you've got to think about these things, though, because now more common than ever, when you're talking to women in a transaction, they will be the decision maker and the primary breadwinner. Also, interestingly, for the housing market, the millennials will inherit more wealth 
than any generation has inherited before. And what's fascinating about that is they don't like the places where their parents put their money. They don't trust the stock market. And can you blame them? They've now lived through two of the biggest crashes in history. Teenagers, older teenagers have lived through almost two of the biggest crashes that have ever happened, certainly once they get into their 20s. So they're not trusting the stock market. They're not trusting the Merrill Lynch's and the Edward Jones. And so when you think about, particularly if you're a realtor and you're doing your networking to drum up more business for yourself, if you're in an area where it is a lot of people under 40, under 35, I wouldn't even necessarily bother trying to do your networking with the Edward Jones and the, uh, and the Merrill Lynch's of the world. You have to find other places to reach that audience now. We talked about that sandwich generation before. This also means that homes are being modified. We're seeing a real trend in homes being situated where they are divided internally so that the parents can live in one area and then the millennial and their children can live in another area. This is going to be a growing uh, aspect of the real estate transaction market. So then one last slide I wanted to show you and then happy to jump in and take questions. Again, not because I am one, because I'm not, uh, but they are considered uh, the kind of butt of the jokes, uh, but I can't emphasize enough how important they're going to be to your business so far. There are 80 million millennials in the United States already. There are two and a half billion people who are in that um, category. What they care about when we ask them about the workforce that they're in is if you go back a few generations, job security and being paid the right amount of money were the number two things for the last 80 odd years that that survey has been asked. It is not that now. Job security and what they get paid now come in second and third. What comes in first is doing good, feeling like they are part of something that is, has a bigger contribution outside of just their role in that organization. So when you, again, when you're thinking about your marketing, I really encourage you, whether you're an inspector, whether you're a realtor, whether you're on the financial side of the business, Think about how your business can tie itself to something that means more than just that transaction. It's easy for me to suggest, well, maybe that means for every time you do a transaction, every time you do an inspection, you donate X amount to something. Um, I'm sure with a little bit of um, time and energy, you can come up with better ideas from that uh, for yourself and what your own business is and maybe what your local community needs. But think about that because that is what these people want to know when they are choosing who to work with. And certainly when I look across this industry, there's very few people doing that. Um, that line down at the bottom, the little graph uh, is a reminder, 50% of the workforce are now millennials slash senials and 75% will be by the year 2020. So that's what I wanted to show you today. I'm going to have a look to see what questions we have. Hopefully, my goal with this is to help you understand that what we think of as being the generations is not always uh, accurate. In addition to that, understanding who these generations are, what they like, and particularly the methods of communication they like, and particularly things like they're looking for an ethical component of your business, will hopefully help you communicate better, position your business better, and ultimately then uh, win more business over your competitors. So at the moment, we don't have any open questions. Happy to, uh, to stay on for a moment if anybody uh, has any that they would want to ask about the audience. team are messaging me. Let's see if there is an internal question here before we hang up. Nope, I think we're good. So if there's no questions, thank you very much. This will be the last time you, uh, you hear from me today. I, I can't thank the team enough for what they've done. They've been amazing. And um, uh, today has been really great. I'm very glad you all came. Mike just snuck in a question, which is a great one. Any comment or observation about millennials not knowing how to maintain a home and how that impacts inspection? That's a really interesting question. I would say that the older part of the millennial cohort, so the people who are now 30 to 40 years old, I don't think it's very applicable. Um, I think that those individuals uh, grew up in a household where they were probably taught more of those things. I think as you get younger than that, those people were starting to be raised by parents who had lost those skills. 
I think it's akin to the data you can see around people not knowing how to cook healthy food and the impact that's had on the obesity crisis. So I do think it's true. I think millennials as a generalization for that, Mike, will not be correct. But I think certainly there will be maintenance issues that, um, uh, that are irrelevant probably 30 years and under. Now, there is also a rise of subscription-based companies where people can get the maintenance in their household done. So I would say when you're inspecting, you might want to take into account or even ask them, do you use a service for your regular maintenance? Because that might be interesting documentation um, for, um, for you to see. And I'm going to check one last place because I see a notification on chat. Okay, um, AJ, uh, you can reach me at dax at homegage.com, just D-A-X, happy to, uh, to answer any questions. Uh, Jeff says, uh, thank you very much, Jeff, I appreciate this, and we'll close with this, and I'll make sure, Jeff, everybody in the team gets to see this. Uh, he says, I do want to thank all the HomeGage staff and everyone that presented for all the great sessions today. Very nice and helpful thing to do. Thank you, Jeff. We appreciate it. Um, everybody here made it very special by uh, coming along and staying with the session so much. Virtually every session had hundreds of people in it and a thousand people registered was, I'll be honest, probably about 900 more than I was expecting when we had this crazy idea about two and a half weeks ago. So we'll end the session there. That is the end of all the programming for today. Again, thank you very much for coming and look out for that survey. We'll send you uh, tomorrow.